Thank you, Mr. John, and good evening, my friends. Some of us have been here for a while already, and I do appreciate very much those men who've come out for our leadership class that we had beginning at 5 o'clock today. I see Brother Cornelius is back with us tonight, and we welcome him from Middleton, Tennessee. And that church is a long time supporting the Lord's work at Heritage Christian University. And it's a pleasure to get to meet him this morning and his wife briefly. And he and I are a member of the same club, and it's, it's all about the way we style our hair. Yeah, it really is. The, uh, the thing you see on the screen there, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And let me tell you now that I'm going to not make this just all negative, okay? Because it would be very easy for us to, to go e extremely negative with this, but uh, that's not what I want us to do. But before I do that, I want to share with you a picture. Uh, that's me uh, right there. You know that's not me, but that's me there. And you see that, uh, that PowerPoint up there. This is at a debate at the University of North Alabama two weeks ago. And this gentleman is Kyle Butt, and I had just uh, finished shaking his hand, and uh, one of my guys snapped that picture with his phone and sent it to me. Uh, his name is Kyle Butt, and he's been here, right, Alan? He's been in this pulpit. But he is an apologist, and he works for uh, a Christian apologist, works for Apologetics Press. And he's all about Christian evidences and writes some very uh, 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 high-quality material in which he shares with the, uh, not only the church but with the nation and he was debating an unbeliever by the name of Bart Ehrman, who, if you can see that screen up there, um, the, the proposition was the pain and suffering in the world indicates that there is no God. And so this was the unbeliever's approach. And, of course, Kyle uh, took that on. And uh, I, I tell you, I actually sat there and wept because he did such a great job in defending the truth, in defending God's word. In defending God as if God needs to be defended, but it, but, it, but really defending the, the brotherhood of believers who have put their trust in God Almighty. And so it was a fine, fine occasion. This is um, William Bennett. He's the former uh, uh, Secretary of Education. And he wrote an article that was published, at least excerpts of it was published in... Uh, the Reader's Digest, in April of 1994. I'm going to read an excerpt of the excerpt. He said, last year, <clears throat> now remember this is, he's writing this in 1994. He's not, this is 2014, so we're talking to, uh, 30, 20 years later. Last year, I compiled the Index of Leading Cultural Indicators, a statistical portrait of American behavioral trends of the past three decades. Among the findings, since 1960, while the gross domestic product has nearly tripled, violent crime has increased at least 560%. I brought my iPad with me tonight, and I clicked on the, the Times-Picayune, and there's story after story of crime in this area. I'm talking about uh, burglaries and rapes and, and uh, murders and accidents and all kinds of terrible things that happen in our community. But in any town of any size, you can read the newspaper and you're going to get the same thing. Divorces, he says, have more than doubled. The percentage of children in single-parent homes had tripled. And by the end of the decade, 40% of all American births and 80% of minority births will occur out of wedlock. These are not good things to get used to, he says. And then he says, in 1940, in 1940, teachers identified the top problems in American schools as talking out of turn, chewing gum, making noise, and running in the hall. In 1990, 50 years later, teachers listed drugs, alcohol, pregnancy, suicide, rape, and assault as the problems they were dealing with in school. These are not good things to get to either. You know, I know people who lock their doors and have uh, burglar uh, alarms and uh, neighborhood watches and they even call uh, the local precinct and will ask uh, uh, patrolmen or, or the troopers to ride by occasionally, check on their business or their house or whatever. 
And this seems to be very common these days. But these people, some of them are of an age where when they grew up, they could leave their house in the morning and play outside and in the neighborhood all day long. Their parents didn't even know where they were and didn't have to worry about it. And they'd come in, you know, by, by dinner time at night. People didn't lock their doors. They left their keys in the car. Uh, I, I, a man told me the other day, he's 66 years old, he said, when, he said, when we went on vacation, when, he said they would, they would go up north somewhere on, uh, to visit relatives on vacation every summer. He said, we did not lock our house. And when we came home, we just fully expected everything to be uh, in place. And it was. No one ever dared get on someone else's property and go into someone else's house and invade their privacy. And uh, they didn't lock the doors uh, because they said, well, they'll kick them down anyway. They didn't lock the doors because they weren't concerned about someone invading their home. And that's not been very long ago. Amen. James is shaking his head back there. There is a coarseness and callousness and a cynicism to our era. The worst of it has to do with our children. Our culture seems almost dedicated to the corruption of the young. They have become inured to the culture, cultural rot that is setting in. People are losing their capacity for shock, disgust, and outrage. Now, this was in 1994, before some of you were born. The ancients called our problem acedia, an aversion to spiritual things and an undue concern for the external and the worldly. Acedia also is the seventh capital sin, sloth, but it does not mean mere laziness. The slothful heart is steeped in the worldly and the carnal, hates the spiritual, and wants to be free of its demands. I'll skip down. Today, much of our society ridicules and mocks those who are serious about their faith. America's only respectable form of bigotry is bigotry against religious people. You can be as mean and as nasty as you want to against religious people these days, and that's all right. Um, the only reason for hatred of religion is that it forces us to confront matters many would prefer to ignore. Today, we must carry on a new struggle for the country we love. We must push hard against an age that is pushing hard against us. If we have full employment and greater economic growth, if we have cities of gold and alabaster, but our children have not learned how to walk in goodness, justice, and mercy, then the American experiment, no matter how gilded, will have failed. Do not surrender, he says. Get angry and get in the fight. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about our country tonight. And... I'm just going to talk for a little while and stop because this subject is too big to just solve all the problems tonight. But, but here's one thing that I, I want us to realize. The Bible says in Psalm 33, 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And when the scripture says the Lord, and then it's talking about the one and true living God, the creator of the universe. Now, here's the first part of the good news. And that is that it could be worse than it is. It's bad. And it's, as a matter of fact, there are so many bad things going on in our country these days. And the direction that our country is going is, seems to be in such a bad direction. I'm talking about culturally, morally, spiritually. That we could actually just become extremely paranoid and afraid and we, we could, we could, I mean, listen, if you just concentrate, if you just dwell on the negative things going on in our country, then uh, you could really get discouraged. I don't want us to do that because I want us to know that, yes, there are a lot of bad things going on, but there are, there are still a lot of good people in this country. And you know some good people. You are a good person. I'm not saying that you can save yourself, that you're the, the Messiah, but you are a good person. That's why you've chosen to honor the Lord tonight by being in worship. And you know people. You even know some people who don't assemble and worship the Lord but uh, are morally good. In other words, you can trust them. They will tell you the truth. You can depend on them. They will, if they tell you they will do something or they won't do something, then, you know, and your children are safe with some people. But we live in such a highly sexualized environment that that's one of the reasons why our kids are not safe anymore. 
That's why you've got you to put cameras in daycare centers. And you've got to do all kinds of things to watch out and make sure that your kids are not being abused. Because our nation has become so warped. And, but it could be worse. Now, last week, we talked about how bad it was at one time in Colossae. And, and we, looked, we read from the book of Colossians, chapter 3. And I want to go back there for just a moment. I'm reading verse 5 and following. This is what Paul is saying to the Christians in Colossae. He says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. Now let's go to Galatians. Now that was, that was, uh, that was Colossians. That was a town... Uh, in Asia Minor. But here's another one. This is Galatians chapter 5. We know this. This is verse 19. He says, The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you now. He's writing to the Christians. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, what about the Corinthians? This is 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And, uh, and we know this, we, we, we share this verse quite often. This is verse 8 and following. Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers. Now, he's writing to the church. Imagine the unchurched world of that day and time. He says, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, or adulterers, or male prostitutes, nor the homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's move on over to Rome, Italy. And this is what uh, Paul says uh, to the Romans. This is beginning in verse 24. Therefore God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become evil. They've been filled with every kind of wickedness, evil and greed and depravity. They're full of envy and murder and strife and deceit and malice. They are gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless and faithless, heartless and ruthless. Although they know God and God's righteousness, uh, they decree that those who do such things deserve death. I'm sorry, I misread that. Verse 32, although they know God's righteousness decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do those very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Now, that's the New Testament. And that's just a few examples from the New Testament. Colossae, Galatia, Corinth, Rome, and uh, Corinth, Greece, and then uh, Rome, Italy. But then if you go to the Old Testament, you go to um, Genesis chapter 18 and 19. And there you read about two cities. You read about uh, a city like, well, the city was called Sodom, and the other was Gomorrah. And... Imagine, you know, that if you were reading years from now about two cities like uh, Baton Rouge and New Orleans. And so God sees all the evil in these two big cities. And he communicates that he's going to destroy these cities. And Abraham intercedes and says, please, please don't. He says, there are good people living in these cities. 
And, um, and, and he negotiates with God and he says, let me see if I can find you 50. You wouldn't destroy these cities if, if there were 50 good people living there, righteous people, would you? And the Lord says, find me 50. Couldn't do it. And so he goes back to work and he's negotiating and he says, would you spare the cities for 40? Couldn't do it. 30, 20, right on. Finally, he says, let me come up with 10 righteous people. Surely, and God says, find me 10 righteous people. He couldn't do it. And then, of course, the angels came and had to take Lot by the hand and pull him out of that city before God destroyed those cities. So that's pretty bad. But it's been worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. It's, it could be worse in this country because it's been worse before. It was worse in Colossae and in Galatia and in Corinth and in Rome and in Sodom. And Gomorrah. But listen to this. Let's go all the way back to the early part of the world. And this is Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. Then the Lord saw how great man's wickedness was on the earth and had become. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. My memory, my mind is, uh, my memory work is in New King James, and I'm reading NIV, and so my memory gets ahead of my, uh, my reading sometime. But look, let me read this again. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Now this means that 24 hours a day, everybody only thought imagine and had evil intentions all the time the world was so bad that god felt forced to destroy the world and start all over and that's why he sent the great flood over the world because he had he had to start all over with just a, a tiny remnant of righteousness which of course uh, was noah and his family and so i uh, i just want us to know that we see a lot of bad in our country but it could be worse. Why? Because it has been worse in the past. Now, what can we do? Can we save our nation? And by the way, we don't want to take on a job that we don't have the strength to complete, you understand. And what, what we're going to learn in this message, and maybe we'll have a follow-up on this, is that God is in control. And, and, and God is always going to be in control. And therefore, we are limited in what we can do. Yes, we can vote, and yes, we can be good citizens, and yes, we can do our part. We can be good neighbors, and we can be the salt of the earth, and we can be the light of the world. We've got those, we have that power. We're, we're being given that power. And, and we're told, uh, as we talked about uh, three weeks ago, I think it was, that we're to be good law-abiding citizens, Romans 13, 1 through 5. And to disobey the law is to disobey God. And that those who are in government are God's ministers. And they've been put there in order for there not to be chaos in society, but there to be some sort of order and some sort of governmental control. And so Christians or the church, we are to be people, we're to be good citizens and we are to cooperate with the government. Same thing is taught in 1 Peter 2 verses 13 through 17 that says that we are to honor the powers that be. And that, that, that we are to be the kind of people who don't give our government authorities trouble. And, of course, we're taught the same thing in 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 4. And that is that we are to pray for kings and for all in authority. And I notice in the public prayers that I hear, hear at Hickory Knoll uh, that we often do that. And I appreciate that. I appreciate Eddie's uh, prayer tonight and some of the things that he, he brought to the attention of God about our nation and about the leaders of our nation. And, of course, we know that there is an exception to obeying the, the civil governments. And we talked about that a couple of three weeks ago when we read from Acts chapter 4, uh, verses uh, 15 through 21, how that the apostles were told to stop talking about Jesus in Jerusalem. Don't mention his name. And then they put them into prison. They says, no, keep quiet about it. Well, of course, you know, the Lord freed them. And here they are in the temple and they're teaching and preaching. And so they're called back in in chapter 5, verses 25 through 29. And they're brought before the council. And the council said to the apostles, did we not tell you? Not to be talking about this Jesus. And you've, you have, you've got the whole city in an uproar, they said. 
And of course, their response was, we must obey God rather than man. And so there's some laws that are higher than our local or our, our, our federal government laws. These are the laws of God, and these, of course, must be obeyed. And so what can we do to spare our country? We need, first of all, to be good citizens, the kind of people that, that, that God will honor and bless and protect. And then we must keep to our mission as the church. Now, <clears throat> there are all kinds of agendas being played out in our country and in our culture every day. There, of course, is the obvious political agenda, which you can, all you got to do is flip a few channels and you see all the political things that are going on locally, statewide, and, and, and federally. And, and so there's that agenda. Then there is the economic agenda, and there is the, uh, there are all the things that are going on to keep us uh, 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 going forward as far as the, the economy is concerned. There is the environmentalist agenda. And there are all these agendas going on, people doing all kinds of things, and they're dedicating there's a there are people who love animals now look i love animals don't don't think that i don't but there are people who love animals more than they love people and they they almost worship animals and that we have a few hollywood characters that uh, you know and, and you'll see them on tv occasionally and they're they're just i mean you can tell that they uh and let's see, I saw a guy on uh, on a show recently. His name is Ricky Gervais or something like that, Gervais. Uh, he's, he's British, but this guy worships animals. I mean, he does. Now, he didn't actually say that literally, but you could just... And, and so, while others of us might show you pictures of our children or our family or our grandchildren, his wallet and his photo and the photos he tweets are about his uh, animals, his pets, you know. And so you got this agenda going on. Lots of agendas going on. But the church has an agenda too. And what is our agenda? Our agenda is to carry on the work that Jesus started when he was here on earth. We are told to continue in his example, 1 Peter 2.21. That means we're to walk in his footsteps. We're to have his mind, Philippians 2.5. And we're to conform to his image, Romans 8.29. And so we are to be... Uh, 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 well, you might say his voice and his hands and his feet in this world today. And he set some things in motion that we need to continue to go uh, forward with because we are the body of Christ. And he is the head of the body. First Corinthians 12, 12, uh, you are the body of Christ and members in particular. And the scripture says in verse 27 of that same chapter that we are the body of Christ and that we must continue to be the kind of people that Christ wants us to be. And then we ask ourselves, what did Jesus do when he was on earth? Because if we're going to continue his work, then we need to know what it was that he did. And there are four basic things that he did. Number one, he went about doing God's will. He said, I'm here to do the Father's will, John 6, 38. And then the scripture says that when Jesus was on earth, he went about doing good, Acts 10, 38. In my town, Florence, Alabama, um, last weekend... And I, and I didn't see this. I didn't pay attention to it. I learned it after the fact because I was here with you. But there is a little ragged mobile home, or we call them trailer park, um, in, on the outskirts of, uh, of Florence. And um, this is made up of poor people, just maybe about uh, 16 uh, mobile homes. And most of them are belong to the owner of the property, and these poor folks rent their mobile home from the... Well, and the deal is, is that he furnishes the water. Well, uh, according to the newspaper, um, the uh, utility department shut the water off because this man was behind in, his, in paying his water bill. And so uh, this, the press catches attention to this because people uh, don't have any water. They, can't, uh, they don't have any drinking water. They don't have any bathing water. They can't flush. They're having to go other places and haul water in with buckets and all that. And uh, and so the the press sends a reporter to the owner of the uh, utility to the uh, trader park and says, "What's going on? You've shut these people's water." He said, "I didn't shut their water off." He said, "You know the," they, but and they said, "Well, why?" And he says, "Because I cannot afford to pay the water bill." Turned out he'd fallen on hard times himself, and he just didn't have the money to pay the water bill, and so he gotten way behind, and so they shut it off. Well, people started bringing water. Gallons of water, drinking water, and putting it on the, the little front porches and, and front steps of the trailers. And, uh, and there was another, there was a follow-up article the next day that good Samaritans were helping out and helping these people. 
And, uh, and then one church on that Sunday, all this was happening like on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, one church on Sunday, one person got up and said, uh, why don't we, and, the, and the, they used the passage, uh, Matthew ten forty two. if you give a cup of cold water in the name of the Lord, then that's, you know, that's honoring the Lord. And they said, why don't we pay these people's water bill? And so they put a basket on the communion table and they said, today as you leave um, services, if you want to help, just put something in the basket. Well, it turns out that they collected 1600 and some change, $1,652.82 or something like that. And then they contacted the powers that be and said, what is the amount of money owed on this little trailer park's water bill? And they said 1650 In other words, they got two cents more in that collection that day than what was needed. Just coincidence, you know, to take care of the bill. Now, what were these people doing? They were doing good. Because, you see, that's what Jesus was about. He was about doing good. And, and he was about helping people, like the men by the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5. Jesus, when he was on earth, went about uh, doing the Father's will. He went about doing good. He, he went about helping people. And he went about evangelizing, Luke 19.10. He said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. And so... That was, the, that was his mission. That was the work that he started. And that's the work that we are to continue. We are to do the Father's will. Uh, we are to go about doing good, like helping people if they don't have any water. And we are to uh, always constantly be looking for ways to spread the good news. And that's called evangelism. And so what can we do to save our country? There's more to be said about this, but we must... Make sure we understand what our, our mission is and stick to our, our mission. You see, we are not in government. As a matter of fact, we are a nation within a nation. And we are a spiritual nation. And I want to talk more about that when we uh, get back together the next time. There's the plan of salvation on the screen. For those of you who have not yet obeyed the gospel, but you want to because you want to be saved. You want your sins forgiven. You want to live forever. You want to be with God the Father and Jesus the Son and God the Holy Spirit for eternity. And you want to be with your loved ones who are also washed in the innocent blood of Jesus Christ. So this song... They were about to sing, who at the door is standing, is to give you a convenient opportunity to let us know that you want to become a Christian. You are a believer, willing to repent, confess your faith in Jesus, and receive baptism for forgiveness of sin. If you are a Christian already, but you need the prayers of the church for burdens in your life, we would be honored to pray for you as well, and you may come at this time. So if you need to come, please come now while together we stand and sing.